Hallelujah. Can we celebrate Jesus? All right, please be seated. Um, I'm trying to put some things into words as I begin to teach you. I have different conferences that are not church conferences that I want to put together. And the title of one of them is The Journey to Healing of the Body of Christ. Dealing with eating and crucial matters in the body. And the second one is actually a book, but the way I like to I like to write books is to teach it. Then people can have access to both the writing material and what has been taught, which is 21 misconceptions about the church and the truth. What I'm about to teach this morning also is also a book. In fact, this is supposed to be the first conference I was supposed to organize for ministers, but I lost my peace and the Holy Spirit said I should teach it at the workers' meeting. A stretch. Then we'll sit on it. So you are not going to find them on the platforms until we are done. Alright, so pick your pen. I'm going to be teaching on the 21st century church and the spirit of objectivity. The 21st century church and the spirit of objectivity. Uh, there's a scripture coming to my heart now. It's not part of the scriptures I prepared for. Uh, I think it was captured in Ecclesiastes. I want the media to help me search out that scripture. It's also one of those words about the last days that says that he that increased knowledge increased sorrow. It is in the book of Ecclesiastes. Now, objectivity as the case may be, is seen as, thank you so much, for in much wisdom is much grief. In fact, yes. But the, word, the root word in the first one is not even wisdom. Alright? And he that increased knowledge, increases sorrow. So just hold on a minute, I'm still going to go there. To be objective is actually the quality that comes with your human nature. Please pay attention. To be objective in itself is a quality that comes with your what? A human nature. As a matter of fact, it's one of the qualities that shows that you are sane, but particularly that you are intelligent. Are you following what I'm saying here? That's objectivity. All right? It is the quality of being able to make decisions without being influenced by emotions. Without being influenced by all right, personal prejudice. For instance, objectivity um, displays itself through questions. And you see it in children as they start maturing. One of the first things that happens to them is that um, 
when you tell them to do something, they want to ask why. If you tell them not to have boyfriends, they're wondering why. To tell you that so and so and so person in their class has boyfriends, has girlfriends. Don't press your phone, don't go to so and so site. Why? See, the question why that they are asking in itself is not a problem. Objectivity is not a problem. It's a sign that you have a mind that is functioning. Because no one should really shove anything down your throat. Are you following what I'm saying here? All right. Um, and objectivity really has bettered many revolutions. The fact that some people rose and they said, We are not going to be a part of this trend. We have to question the status quo. We have to question what is called the reality here. Um, we have to question many things, all right? And at some point or the other in our lives, we all have had to be objective. Oh, you can't marry her. She's from so so and so and so tribe. Hey, I take exception to that. That's objectivity. An object. I say, I don't have to say yes to everything. You don't have to shove everything down my throat. All right? Are you following what I'm saying here? Objectivity in itself is the quality of a healthy mental state. Are you following what I'm saying here? Are you following what I'm saying? All right. Um, you know, I've studied into a lot of movements, um, both in Africa, in the East, and the West. You know, there was a time that the Roman Catholic Church was in charge of the political system of the world. Are you aware? Yes. Are you aware? Yes. The Pope was, as it were, the highest order of authority. Those were the days that they were selling letters of indulgence. Those were the days that they were talking about purgatory and all those things. All right? And one of the things that was particular about that season is that people didn't have access to the Bible so they could reason alright and oppose many of the things they were trying to shove down their throat until the time came when a young German monk I'm not even know his name Martin Luther rose And said to himself that I will not rest until the Bible is in the hands of every peasant on the street. So what was happening there then was that the Pope were using the secrecy of access to the Bible to manipulate people. In fact, people were being slaughtered. When you oppose the Pope, can be killed. And it didn't start with those popes. It was there in the days of the high priest. And you know how those guys came? They were the 70 elders of Moses that were elected. That was how we got the Pharisees and the Sadducees. They were anointed alongside to function with Moses in the priestly office. But the time came, all that was left was the title without the mantle. 
got corrupted. It will amaze you that it was the synagogue that offered Jesus to be killed. They were the ones who said crucify him. They were the ones who said we need Barnabas. Kill Jesus. They were the ones who paid the Roman soldier to conceal the news of the resurrection. A lot of bribery activity took place after the resurrection. Not masterminded by Herod. No. Not by Pilate. No. By the synagogue. Now, one of the things, now, everywhere objectivity, let me just start from there. Let me continue from there. Has been, there's been questioning. And these questions are the things that usually bet revolutions. Revolution is what you have when people have been subjected under servitude. Sometimes mental servitude. And sometimes physical. For such a long time. And people have to rise and say not again. It starts with questions. It starts with someone not conforming to the status quo. It starts with someone not allowing the same ideologies pass to them. It starts with someone. You can check all those movements. It starts with people asking questions. All right? Um, the appetite in, um, appetite in South Africa starts with questions. The ANC were asking questions. Why do we have to have certain train station for the white and certain for the black? Questions. Anytime there's going to be revolution, a question must be behind it. All right? And that was what, you know, led to the rise of Madiba formerly known as Nancy Mandela. People like that rose at that season, Bishop Desmond Tutu and all of them. The bishop was in the church leading the fight from the church, leading revolution from the church. Madiba was a lawyer, all right, leading from the streets and about five friends. In fact, one of the ways people have been subjected to slavery is that they are put in positions where they can't question status quo. And because before the coming of Jesus, there's going to be enlightenment. Alright? There's going to be a lot of enlightenment. Academically. There's going to be a lot of enlightenment alright, in cultures. People are going to question many things. We are going to have kings question the traditional right that brings them into power. We are going to have young politicians question the need for godfatherism. We are going to have subjects question the authority of their rulers. You must understand that leaders don't have subject. Leaders have followers. Rulers have subject. We're going to have developing nations question the authority all right, or the manipulation of developed nations all right, and the system of divide and rule culture. We're going to have children question the method of their parents. We're going to have many of them come to the point where they are not going to take it again. So most of the revolutions that will take place in the 21st century, which includes the church, is going to be internal revolutions. Now, for some of these, God is going to be behind the veil trying to break the new house. And for some, there is nothing new to be bettered. But just pay attention. Are you following what I'm saying here? Alright, for instance, a time is going to come in the body of Christ in Nigeria. Not just in the body of Christ, 
both Christians, Muslims, and traditional, um, should I say, practitioners, that no one is going to be allowed access to gather people and lead without a license. And no one is going to be issued license without a certificate that shows that they went to study to become what they are claiming to be. It's going to look like um, a season of persecution of the church. But you see, God is also going to be behind that veil. Because God is also tired of sin that anybody can just wake up any day and just say that they have a calling and gather thousands of people and manipulate them with many things and put their destinies at risk. We're having many people who claim to be in prophetic ministries who can't even quote a verse of the scripture. And yet there are thousands of souls. So God is going to be behind that veil compelling them to go to Bible schools. And in the course of that, many of them are going to learn the Holy Scriptures. Are you following what I'm saying here? But you see, some Pentecostals, when that time comes, will call it a season of persecution against the church. But you see, God is going to be behind it. So there's going to be a lot of internal revolutions. As a matter of fact, there's going to be a lot of breakaways of ministries. Alright? And for some, it will not be the original satisfaction of God that that should happen. But the rigidity of men will leave God with no other option than for the new to break out of the old. Are you following what I'm saying here? Are you following what I'm saying here? Alright? So please pay attention. Now, I'm just trying to paint the picture of the things that are going to be experiences. Alright? In this season that we are in. One of the factors that is going to bet many of these things I'm sharing with you is access to the internet. If you can remember um, during COVID season, all right, people had access to different services of their choice online. True or not true? Yes. Um, many Pentecostals got filled after COVID. True or not true? Yes. And what happened? Um, majority of um, certain indigenous churches that have for a long time seen media as what is not necessary were not able to meet up with the people and their needs in those seasons. And many of the things they've said to them, for instance, I saw a video of something that happened somewhere in Lagos. Here is a guy, in quotes, a prophet, who was holding a meeting. And a woman was in front. Obviously a widow from the conversation they were having. And he was talking to the woman. That before I, when I prayed for you then, you made a pledge before God. And the pledge is that you are going to give God a land. And apparently he was talking about himself. You see? That you were going to give God a land. He said, but you have not fulfilled the pledge. He said, I'm going to curse you. And you are going to be unfortunate. And you see, he was saying many things. And he was saying, you see, you don't make pledge before me and not fulfill them. I'm a kind of prophet that can destroy your life and I can damage you. You see, one of the reasons why there's going to be need for people to break out are also going to be problems triggered by um, the church. For people who attend such place and will have to enter the church every time there's a revival or every service with fear and panic as if somebody's going to kill you. In these seasons, they have access to the internet and they can listen to every, many services online where people are being treated like kings. And one of those days they are going to rise. You see, 
And the slave will question his taskmasters and say, why do I have to sit here for so long? And there's going to be revolution, but internal revolution. Are you following what I'm saying? And one will speak to another and say, why do we have to be here? And people will be convinced that, you see, the church cannot be a place of emotional torture. If there's no joy here, if there's no love here, we have to get out. You see, people are going to call such reactions different names. Let me give you an instance. Thank God for the question Pastor Wally asked when we had that meeting, um, building your finance from the scratch, about leadership. And why is it that in most places, particularly churches, when a spiritual leader um, asks people, there is always the, the tendency to only want to produce people only after the order of spirituality, you see. And spirituality will mean after the order. So I'm not saying that's what it means. But um, what I'm talking about will mean that a pastor, if care is not taken, just want to produce pastors. But you see, there are people who are not called to be pastors, but are to be fathered. There are people who are not called to be pastors, that are to be led. So it is not a true sign of success that as a pastor, every fruit that comes out of us are going to be necessarily pastors. If there is no adjustment around this area in the body of Christ, what is going to happen is questions. Somebody is not called to be a pastor. This fellow is called to social works. Called to many other things outside. You see? Called to politics. All right? Call to acting. Call to music. I'm not talking about worship now. Music. All right? And it's looking like if you don't do it this way, you're not going to be here. Now that's a human barricade. And there's going to be questions around it. And people are going to find their way. But you see, here is the balance. Objectivity. History has shown to us that it's been one of the most needed tools to bet human advancement. In fact, in civilization, in politics, science, all right, family life, reshaping cultures, and all those things. Objectivity has played a major role. People keep doing the same thing until someone thinks differently. Are you following what I'm saying here? Are you following what I'm saying here? Are you learning something from this? Yeah. <laughs> All right. For instance, while you were on campus, many of you were part of many campus revolution. A Luther Continua, Victoria Sata. Probably there's an increment, school fees, um, hostel fee. Some lecturers are trying to compulse and out at the rate that are not reasonable. All right? Some other things victimization. Students gather themselves and say, a Luther continua, Victoria Sata. But you see, here's where I'm going. It's going to be a long discourse. So it is not something I hope to finish in one class. You see, there's a very thin line. Between objectivity and stubbornness. There's a very thin line. For instance, please look up. I have prayed for you before I start teaching this subject. But if you don't, please pay attention. 
if you are not given to prayers to understand where the line of demarcation is this thing that I'm teaching can throw you away it can be your last message you will hear as a Christian and that's why I'm going to try to show you the red line So let me give you an illustration of what I mean. When LA Church was starting, I called the guys to the house. Said, you guys are going to be with me overnight. So I sat down. And I spent time teaching them. You see. And I told them to ask questions. And they asked me questions. Intelligent questions. Pastor, what do we do if somebody comes to the church? With dreadlock. So they are welcome. If Christ can die for them, they are welcome. Can someone with dreadlock become a worker in church? Why not? You see? Okay. Those boys, they, they mean me. They must have discussed. And look at me again. One more question. Will you pour the oil to ordain somebody with dreadlock on the head? I said, give me a minute to think. <laughs> you see, you are dealing with a generation that their questions must be answered. Are you following them here? But you see, in answering the question of that generation, you also must discern never to answer it under pressure. You see, and you've got to answer it based on principles of the scriptures. And I know that these guys asking me this question, no matter the answer I give them, they will take it. But you see, they can zone off and say, don't mind this man. Early church is just another, don't mind him. We know what we are going to do. See, it requires a lot of wisdom. But you see, I was quiet not because of answer to the question. I was quiet because they need to understand where the line of demarcation is. There's a line. I said there's a line. Because the next question after the dreadlock is not going to be dreadlock. That's nothing. You see, I went to God in prayers about that question. And God said, would you have come to me if this question was asked in America? So if your answer is yes or no, your problem is not scriptures. Your problem is culture. You see, let's leave that. But you see, for the sake of the time, that the question of the objectivity it's not going to be around hairstyle, but about sexuality, gays, lesbian, homosexuals. It is important that while we are doing what we are doing, a generation is aware that those things are not telling us that we can indulge, but we are actually coming down to the level of those who are lost so that by so doing, we can get them saved. Not so sinners can remain sinners. I'm not saying anyone who is using dreadlock is a sinner. But I'm saying that to the Rome, I, I write, I write, or to the Gentiles, I'm not saying I become a gentleman, but I become like one in similitude of them, so that by the reason of that, they can be saved. Not so that they can be maintained. If we're going to make the best of sinners the best of saints, we're not going to be the one to endorse them continually looking like their parents of such. You see, we've got to introduce them to the light. But we also need to understand where culture stands and where scripture stands. Are you following what I'm saying here? So that we are not teaching scripture as culture or culture as scriptures. Mm. Hello. <laughs> mm. Hallelujah. Are you being blessed? I said there's a line of demarcation. Are you aware? I said there's a line of demarcation. Are you aware? Yes. There's a line. And you've got to know where the line is. We are, for the first time in the history of Christianity, having Christians like you. You see, and one of the things that God is calling me to do in this season is to be a whistleblower to churches, to pastors, letting them know that we are not in the age 
where people's questions can be swept under the carpet. Because those who are holding the microphone got their true sentiment and many things. We are in the age where their questions need answers. Because anywhere there's no answer, the enemy is going to come and take advantage of that. Are you following me? <laughs> where the issue is, is where the red demarcation is, where the red line is. Ah. Uh, Are you following me? Hello? So let me say this to you. See, scripture says that you shall know the truth. And the truth shall what? Make you free. But you see, what is written in that scripture is that the truth should make you free. It is that the truth shall. And what the devil tries to do is to make sure that there are opposite results generated from the same thing. For instance, if I have, okay, let me put it like this. What the truth does is relative to the one who is listening to the truth. Let me give you an instance. Is that okay? Let me give you an instance. Please come. Now, um, Rob, will you come? Now, look at it. Before I got married, I had many struggles with the issue of relationship. It was a very shameful season of my life. And I'm not telling you, I'm telling you the real truth. Very shameful season. Because I got into several relationships I thought would work, but they didn't work. You see, and most times, I mean, <laughs> he's a comrade. He knows many things. I gist with them. Not just as sons, but as friends. You see? They know the struggles. But you see, the same thing that this man can know and can just stay in one spot and say, I will pray along with a pastor. Somebody else can know that truth and becomes a license for misbehavior. You see? And that's why as leaders, people say that I we want leaders that will talk to us in the reality. It's relative. The reality can destroy you. Somebody is pregnant. Early pregnancy. You see? And the fellow is having symptoms of threatening ab abortion. And here is the senior pastor. The wife just had miscarriage. Alright? And they had to keep it. Maybe a few people are aware. Alright? And they say we'll pray alongside. But here is somebody in the crowd who looks up to that pastor. And says things like, I mean, I, look how I love what God is in their life. And somehow gets the information. What happens? The fellow says that, well, who am I? If this can happen to a pastor, place to the hands of the enemy. So sometimes the truth you are requesting for, you are not in the configuration that it can make you free. You are in the configuration that that same truth can destroy you. And that's the truth. You've got to understand that. If you are going to be a balanced Christian in these days and time, you need to understand what I'm teaching. But you see, you need to understand the red line. Let me give you an instance. You know, David had many mighty men, right? Talk to me. Talk to me. He did. But there was one amongst them 
particularly. Joab. When David, in fact, Joab was the only guy that was aware of what really happened to Uriah. He was the bad guy in that squad. He was like the Sergeant Roger of a bacha that he used to do the dirty jobs. And you see, that got him corrupt. That messed up his life. Messed up his life. I want to believe I'm not making a mistake. When Absalom was trying to take the kingdom from his father and was running away, and scripture said that a tree with two branches, just his hair got called on it. And was dangling on the tree was the one who threw the spear killed him and that's why when david was going to die one of the instructions he gave to solomon is that you see joab his hair should not go to the grave in peace Are you following me? <laughs> All right. So, the church is not a perfect place, it has never been. Not at any point in history have we seen that the church is perfect. Not even during the 1930 revival. Not even during the Azusa Street revival. Because if you look at the way the fire of the revival went down, it shows you that our imperfection kills revivals. Are you following what I'm saying here? Are you following me? Our imperfection kills revivals. You look at separation of ministries from each other, the apostolic. Christ Apostolic, the subject matters that brought the separations, the Aladura movement, the world based movement, scripture union movement, and all those things. The church has never been a perfect entity. The church is only going to be perfected in Christ. But you see, the mistake the church should not make is confusing objectivity with stubbornness. For instance, here's a young girl in church and a pastor is inviting you to come have a meeting with him in awkward places or at awkward times. Inviting you to come to an hotel giving you the room number either married or unmarried at that point you've got to think and decline it that's not the point to say that we can't say no to a man of God you have to think I want to say some things You know, when I look at you like that, I'm praying for you. What I'm teaching now is not something you should assume you hear on this city. And I'm teaching this so that there will be no trouble in the body of Christ. Are you following what I'm saying here? 
I said I'm teaching this so there will be no what? Trouble. I was speaking with a friend. You see, and we're talking about a church. Whose pastor has gone through many scandals. And he said, what I respect so much about this church is that they have a very solid structure. He said, their structure is so solid that nobody is going to leave this man, even if they meet him or catch him sleeping with somebody on the pulpit. You see, I'm not going to swallow that. Because that, in a sense, gives young ministers a sense or a belief culture. That solid ministry will be that you will raise the people that will follow you, even in decadence. But you see, that may be marketable. It may seem to give the minister the room to touch anything and do anything and go scot free. People are doing that now. But you see, we are building that which will be consumed by fire. We are in the days where you have to make the decision as a pastor. Are you building for eternity or you are building an empire? I think what is solid building is to have a set of people that follow you as you follow Christ. Do you get what I'm saying? Yes. What is solidarity is that I invite you to minister as long as you are a minister. I can't invite you to preach in the midst of a scandal. The pulpit is not a way to compensate men. You see, sometimes people are afraid to say this because they don't know if they will mess up or not. Many of the things out there are just on that to fair too. That is, the market they are selling is about to be dispersed. This message is not for someone who already has the spirit and the nature of stubbornness. But for one who has the mind of Christ. Not for people who have suspicions. You know, many times when young ladies come to me and say, I want to be my spiritual father, I still observe the way many of them relate with me. It's carefulness. They are trying to prove to be sure this is a man you can trust. It's wisdom. <laughs> it's wisdom. And I respect that. You don't trust the man just when you are meeting him. Fantastic. Trust his end. Many of your parents are not allowing you to go to young churches. Am I sure I'm going to allow my daughter to do so? I doubt. His hand. Some of you look down on them when they see those things. You are the one who knows you are being blessed here. But you can also meet people here that will destroy you. I said you can meet people here that will destroy you. That's the truth. Because in the great house there are many vessels. I'm going to continue from here some other time. But you see, like I said, I'm also going to teach on the journey to healing in the body of Christ. And these are books. You see. At the end of the day, the only work that we stand is the one that is Christ. We've taught loyalty out of context. That means that, I mean, have you seen pastors who tell their sons to prove that they are sons by allowing them to sleep with their wives or fiancés? Sexual abuse is not a way to prove loyalty. A man of God trying to touch your body is not a way to prove that you are loyal. That's not the way Christ taught us. That's not the structure he laid in the church. 
He had many girls around him. Mary Magdalene was a beautiful girl. But scripture said he was tempted in all points, yet without sin. You see, if you are going to live a life and walk out of this world, finishing in victory, in good old age, having turned nations to God, as though the devil doesn't exist, you've got to live a life of integrity. To, to claim grace and not be a person of integrity is not to understand what grace is. Grace is not an antidote after sin. It is that which empowers us above sin. Many of the doctrines that are being propagated in the last days are doctrines that makes the church at the receiving hand and the man of God liable to sin. That's why there are thin lines. I wish I have not taught this message this morning because of where I'm stopping now. And now I'm quite a bit bothered. If I can leave you at this point till next week Sunday, a lot of things might have gone wrong. You see? Because the next series I'm supposed to teach on is audacity. So I, I guess I might want to continue from here on Tuesday. Is that okay now? And um, Bible study starts when? 5.30. Alright, can I request that you come by five so I can have enough time? Alright? And we can journey into these conversations. For those of you who have the call of God, at some point you are going to be faced with the choice. Whether to build your own or to build Christ's. One of my greatest fears is that we are not going to see some pastors in heaven. Please be seated. Thank you. Now, some of you don't even know what you believe now. Whether it's once saved, forever saved, or not. Somehow you don't even know what to believe. You don't profess them, but your conduct shows you believe them. You just want to put your whole life, all right, in the line and hope. Christians have different questions now. So we need pastors who are not philosophers, but teachers of the word. People have different questions. If rapture should take place and meet a believer masturbating, well, the believer make it for rapture. These are questions. These are not the questions you will find some 30, 40, 50 years ago. But these are questions now in the church. And there's a need for people who understand the balance of grace to teach. We need the rise of teachers. Not philosophers. Sometimes they may not be called primarily to the office of a teacher. You see, Kenneth Egan was called primarily to the office of a prophet. And when Robert's son committed suicide, Robert could not be consoled. Because much more than the death, he needed an answer. He's been teaching scriptures, but there's a need for someone with more insight. Has he gone to heaven or hell? People were going to see him and ministers were going to console him. But Kenneth E. again didn't go. Because he was praying. And on one of those days, he had an encounter with Jesus. And he saw the son of Arobat standing with Jesus. And Jesus spoke with him. You see? Because Kenneth E. again was a prophet. And told him and showed him with scriptures. Because visions without scriptural light is illusion. And the final blow or the worst blow the devil can deal to the body is death. You see, that's... And he, he, I mean, God spoke with him and said, tell him and console him that your son is with me in heaven. But you see, that's the truth. But it's a dangerous one. Somebody can also get up being frustrated, thrown down by demons pushed to commit suicide and the fellow said if it was true 
in the case of the son of Arabat, it should be true now in my case, except God is a racist and the fellow kills himself. What the truth does to you is relative to your configuration. You can know the truth about some of the things I'm teaching and become insubordinate, become rebellious, stiff naked. And that's one of the reasons why we've had rebellious moves is that people try to double into these things without drawing the red lines and showing with patience, particularly if your heart is littered with negative emotions and offenses. This is not a topic you should teach because we are going to mirror and pollute everything with the offense in your heart. It's going to come visibly. It's going to come as an attack against the church. You're going to be spewing prejudices. But you see, that's to be taught from the point of neutrality of scriptures and love. So sometimes the deep thing is not even what the man is teaching. But where he's teaching it from and how he's teaching it. If you have offense in your heart towards the church, towards certain pastors, this is not a topic you should double into. And I'm giving that warning. Are you following what I'm saying here? Are you following what I'm saying here? Now I'm giving a warning. Are you following what I'm saying here? All right? Last year, as I round up, someone asked the question why we're still using the smaller tents. That in a case where a lady gets pregnant in church and the church treats the fellow as this and that. You see, and I had to answer that question with so much carefulness. Because it matters who is giving the report. You see, when people who are insubordinate, rebellious, stiff naked, are giving the report, they paint the church in bad light. And you need to understand what it takes to stand here. To stand here. Not to preach once in a while, but as a pastor of a church, to understand what church is. That sometimes you can become the worst enemy of people by trying to deliver them from their worst enemies. Somebody is into something that will destroy him. But the definition of a pastor with a large heart in this century is the one who allows us. How many of you have noticed that I discipline people the most when my birthday is getting closer? And it's intentional. I don't want to be celebrated as one who has led people to hell. I don't want to. You see? I've cried by what people make mistakes that I know that they may never recover from. I was online and I saw one of my sons wearing suit, bow tie, the Bible, joining two people together beside a swimming pool. It's not a pastor, never been. But you went to undertake such only assignment because we're in the days of objectivity. You see, he didn't know the background to the story and I knew those who was joining together. And I called him that the question that you ask yourself is if these guys have been Christians all their lives, how come no pastor was willing to join them? If the church gets to a point where we are saying everything must go, this, 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 this. <laughs> it's going to soon become the church of Satan. And you see, before I called him, I have interceded for him for more than three weeks. Many not discerning the body are falling asleep. And when scripture uses the word falling asleep, it's sleep is a polite word to say they have died. But you see, 
I called him. And I rebuked him. And I put him on fasting and prayer. But you see, objectivity tells you that you still have the chance to despise what he's saying and not do it. I didn't teach a marriage counseling this year, did I? No. Because I'm showing them, hey, 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 hey. Hey, how do we help people get this balance? So that the time will not come, we'll have extinction of men, the real men. I went somewhere with one of my sons. It was a ministerial assignment. And he got a message. And the message was from the wife, saying, I'm vomiting now. And he showed me the message. He wanted to leave where we were. To rust down. I said, No. You see, you have to be caring, but you've got to train your wife. You've got to train your wife. You have to train your wife how to balance care plus discipline. That's where real. <laughs> because it's going to get into trouble. When we teach you part A, there's the part B that you need to know the balance. Be sub wife, husband and wife subject and um, submit to one another in the fear of God. Hey, hey, there are balance. <laughs> because if we don't understand where the balance meets, we're going to have extinction of real men. I said, I'm not going to take any married counseling if I'm going to talk to your married counsel. I'm looking at you. The, you know, I'm not even like I can be very principled. I look at you there. I perceive in my heart, this fellow doesn't think it's a necessary thing. Hey, I'm not going to be your teacher. So that we will not have a generation where married counseling is now optional. The real work is not where what I'm teaching. The real work is at what point I draw the line. Between love and toughness. That's where the work is. If I allow you, you will celebrate me and praise me and so seed to my life and give me money and give me things while you are on your way to being self-destruct. And you will even call me the best pastor on earth. <laughs> and that's why you have to discern the difference between largeness of heart and when you are being left to yourself. Anywhere you see balance, love exists side by side with discipline. That's the balance. Care exists side by side with training. You don't just care for your children, you train them. And they can't be objective. Don't steal. There's no objectivity around it. Don't fight. There's no objectivity around it. When God told, and when Samuel told God, as uh, Saul, as instruction from God, to wait, they are going to sacrifice this. If, if there's no skillfulness around that instruction. The instruction is wait. Let's leave it there. And that's why if God is not calling you to start a church, don't try it. You will kill yourself. If you know what it takes to stand here, <laughs> you know, last week, a pastor died 
after preaching in a meeting. I mean, people blame him. He didn't rest. He didn't rest and all that. So he was going somewhere to a minister. And I just put myself in the shoes. You get an invitation somewhere in the body of Christ. And four days to the meeting, you feel you are not feeling somewhere. And send a message and call and say, I beg in the name of Jesus, I can't come for this meeting. Ah, it's an arrogant man and all that. But you have to come to a point where you stand on the truth regardless of what anybody feels. That's wisdom. So there are truths I will know that you are not to sit down here and be objective about those truths. You are to obey. You know, I've beautified objectivity, but we are still going somewhere with the teaching. That's why I'm not excited I've left you here. Let's bow our heads and ask God for the spirit of wisdom. Ask him for help. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen.